So we're going to go ahead and get started. As a reminder, we are starting on the hour now, um, since there's no longer any Michigan time. So welcome to the Tools and Technology Seminar Series. Um, there's a sign-in sheet. I think it actually already circulated, but um, if you haven't signed in, uh, please do so. Again, it helps us with uh, justifying the pizza, and we want to be able to continue offering that. So uh, I think we'll just go ahead and move right into the presentation. So today's speaker is Daniel Kwong, and he is a postdoc in both the Parker Lab and the Guan Lab in DCMMB. Thanks. So today I'm going to talk about Guan Rank, generalizing right uh, sensor uh, data into standard regression problem through complete ranking. Uh, fun fact about me, one of the things I want to do for my postdoc was to write tools that were actually useful and used by people. And what do you think? ironic. Ironically enough, there's a tools and technology seminar, so here I am talking about it. And another, another interesting fact, I just finished this last night and didn't have time to practice it, so let's just yellow it and hopefully it goes well. All right, so I'm going to talk about, I'm first going to give a background, what is survival analysis? So it's a general, it's sort of more or less a generalization of uh, aggression analysis, but with a little bit of a twist. Um, let's say you have a clinical trial over here and you have several patients in there, not only do you have your, the duration between when they started the study and when they died, um, you also have this death observation variable or a status binary variable that will tell you whether their death was observed or not. Now no, now, no does not necessarily mean they live because, of course, realistically, everybody has to die eventually. You can make, make a memento mori or a valor or a joke about that. It just means their death was just not observed during the time of the trials. They likely died after the trial or well after the trial. Everybody dies eventually. Yes means their death was observed during the experiment. And the point of, and one of the goals of survival analysis is to predict the uh, duration until an event occurs, such as death. Now, in it feels like biology, me uh, medicine, this is called survival analysis. You can imagine there are other events and other fields like engineering where you try to find um, the time of a failure. In this case, it's called reliability analysis. Um, in economics, it's called duration analysis. And in sociology, it's called event history analysis. Now, another interesting fact about survival analysis is that it can be seen as a form of semi-supervised learning. And semi-supervised learning is a pretty exciting field of machine learning where uh, not only do you have a lot of lab do you have labeled data, you, also, you may have also a lot of unlabeled data, and you need to write your algorithm accordingly. So, and the data that are right, um, the ones that have, oh yeah, I should also mention the ones that are have uh, where the deaths are not observed, we call these right sensor data, and because we do not know their actual death types, their sensor on the right side. There's also another interesting fact. There's also such thing as left sensor data where you don't know the birth times, the beginning events times. But um, that's not going to be covered here. And uh, frankly, I have yet to see a very useful application of left sensor data. Another thing you should know about survival analysis is this concept called the Kaplan Meyer estimator, which attempts to estimate the survival function. The survival function, as uh, you can see an example here, which will tell you essentially the percentage of all samples that are still alive as a function of time. So at time equals zero, everyone is still alive. So it's going to be 100%. And at the end of the trial, everybody is either dropped out, so we don't know whether it's dead or not, or everyone has already died. So you would have a survival probability of zero. Now, this is what you can what you can do with these survival functions is you can compare in a statistical fashion two groups. Let's say you have a uh, treatment group, and you have a control group, and you have a group that you 
uh, treated with a drug, and you want to compare whether your drug is effective or not, you may draw a survival function, have the Meyer estimators for both groups, and see if there's any statistical difference between the two groups to see if your drug is effective using a long break test. If you want to, you can also make it a little bit fancier. Let's say you have four different cancer types here. You want to see if there's any differences in survival probabilities between the four groups. Then you can plot them out and say, oh, the green guys die out a lot sooner than the blue guys. Actually, it says uh, adeno, adeno carcinoma and squamous cancer. Um, you, you, there's probably some people here who know a lot more about cancer than I do. As you can tell, you don't really need to know, uh, when you're dealing with data, you don't actually need to know the underlying biology a lot of the time. You just need to understand how to apply the mathematical algorithms. It's a little funny. So current solutions for survival analysis, analysis from a computational perspective, there actually aren't a lot of things. Uh, the most popular model for survival analysis is the Cox proportional hazard model. It's basically the linear regression or, or the logistic regression of survival analysis is the simplest one possible and works well in a lot of cases. There's also survival random forest. Uh, there's a support vector machine version. And I also mentioned Cox and NNN, spelled the, uh, how, how's her name? The Lana Garma group. I included this because I saw her last week and if she was here today, she would probably be upset if I didn't mention her method. So there it is. But I don't see her today, so I guess I don't have to talk about it. Um, in terms of software packages, there's a, uh, you also have very relatively few solutions, and they all have their they all have their uh, positives and negatives. There's Scikit Survival. It's a Python package that's built to emulate the Scikit Learn library. I will talk more about Scikit Learn later because that's pretty important for this talk. There's a pretty good, uh, famous library, or a well-cited library called Lifelines for Python. Um, but probably the big uh, the big one, the one I see that's probably used the most often because survival analysis is usually more seen as a statistical problem, rather a machine learning problem, is R survival, and its name applies for R. And uh, if you want to use survival random forest, you actually can't find the random forest model uh, version in any of these three packages. You need to you need to find it within its own R package called random forest SRC. I think that stands for random forest survival or SVM regression. I don't know. I forgot what SRC stands for. Um, but compare this to reg compare survival analysis to regular regression. Regression, you got so many, you got so many options. You got linear regression, neural network, support vector regression, random forest, auto boost, gradient boosting, XG boost, k nearest neighbors, Gaussian process regression. I'm only touching a service here. There are probably like hundreds of more methods just for regression alone. And don't even get me started on classification. So. One central question in this talk is going to be, can you extend the flexibility of regression analysis to survival analysis? And since I'm giving this talk, you already know the answer is going to be yes. Right? And you can already see it in the title of the talk. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the Cox proportional hazard model very fast. Like I said before, it's one of the most popular models for survival analysis. It's basically, it's like, it's the simplest model possible. It is the linear regression of, or the logistic regression of survival analysis. So warning, here, it's going to be a little bit of math. If you don't like math, you can ignore what I say for the next few seconds. So let, X, uh, uh, let xi be a vector, uh, a p-dimensional vector, which is going to be your features. If you're a statistician, you'll probably annoyingly call it covariates. I will always call them features. I will never call them covariates of some subject, for example, i. The hazard function, which is a function that describes the number of events per unit time. As follows this form, uh, lambda. You notice uh, this basically tells you that the number of events that occur per unit time will change as time goes on. So at time equals zero, you will probably have zero deaths. And as time approaches infinity, you will also have zero deaths because by that time, everybody is dead and there's no one left to die at that point. And there may be some points in between there where you will have most deaths. Like for example, at age 80, that's where you expect, that's the expected life. Uh, that's life expectancy for most Americans, roughly, and that's where you expect the most deaths to occur, something like that. And you can see that the so hazard function here is, uh, you can separate the variables here between time and the features uh, vector. Beta here is basically going to be your coefficients. You can kind of see them um, compared to linear regression. You can compare them to the slope, the slopes you would see in linear regression. 
Um, you can already tell that this is going to be a relatively simple model in that case. And in, in the Cox model, you can define a probability function, a likelihood function here, where Li of beta will tell you the probability of an event occurring for subject i necessarily occurring at that time. And with this single likelihood function, you could define a total partial likelihood function, which you can then convert to a partial log likelihood function. And in statistics and machine learning, we oftentimes like to use the log function because the log is a monotonically increasing function and converts products to sums. It's very mathematically uh, and has a very nice derivative. It's very it's very easy to deal with. That's why we use logs instead of um, not logs. And you want to find the beta. With, uh, you want to find the best coefficients for your model. You would optimize beta using Newton's method. Uh, you, some of you have, might have seen the newton raphson uh, method for finding zeros in your scientific computing class. This is the optimization version of it. Here, you may notice there's a Hessian matrix uh, for, uh, Hessian matrix here, with uh, and where you have to take the inverse of a Hessian matrix, and that is actually from, from a mathematical and statistical point of view, this is this is a very elegant um, algorithm. It converges fairly fast. It's it's uh, very succinct on the board. It's very easy to write. Fairly easy to program. The problem is this inverse of the matrix here. Uh, from a computational uh, perspective, this is a complete nightmare. Taking on, taking the inverse of a matrix is a very slow operation. It's also very numerically unstable. You normally would not do this for most normal uh, purposes. And I'm going to talk more about how this is going to be uh, one of the Cox's mod Cox model's weaknesses later. Now, here's an example of the Cox model in action. Let's say I learned my betas. I train a Cox, very simple Cox model. I learned my betas. And let's say I have a model that has, I don't know, eight, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight features, eight covariates. And I have four hypothetical samples here. Since I have a trained Cox model, I could, I could, I could create hypothetical fake survival curves, uh, survival functions for each of these uh, fake individuals. And you could probably, you could probably um, interpret these curves to mean if I had, say, an infinite number or a million copies of subject one, then subject one or sample one will follow this survival function. You'll have this many people dying at each time. And if I had a million copies of subject four, then they, um, those million copies of subject <coughs> four will follow the red survival function here. Um, yeah. So it's not a very accurate model, but it works well for most purposes. Now, how would you evaluate how well your model is actually doing? If you predict when a subject will die, right, if you, you a, uh, if you create a prediction, how well do you know your predictions are actually doing? You will use a, a metric in survival analysis called the C index. The C index, the C index is a generalization of the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, like the one you see on the right here. Now, the area under the operating characteristic curve, you know that um, your it's for classification. You know your classification model does well if the area of approaches one, you know that your model is doing basically random chance if it's equal to the area of the diagonal, 0.5. And you know you should never trust your model at all if it has an area on the curve of zero. And the C index also has follows a similar principle. It has values between zero and one. Zero means never trust it. 0 0.5 means it's performing completely random. And one means is essentially perfect. Another fun fact. You, there's, one, there's actually a very nice interpretation of the area under the curve. It actually describes the probability that a classification model assigns a higher value to a positive sample over a negative sample. And that is also how you can um, interpret the C index. You can, um, you can interpret it as the percentage of concordant pairs. Now, unlike the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, I can't actually draw a nice pretty graph for you. I know how much some of you like graphs, plotting graphs and stuff. The CNX does not have um, an equivalent graph to interpret. Now, another way to interpret the percentage of concordant pairs is 
how well can the model uh, prioritize higher risk patients? So let's, I have a very large, ugly table here to give you some examples. Let's say I have two samples, two people here, sample A and sample B. Sample A, sample A and sample B status are both one, which means we know exactly when they died. Right? Sample A has a duration of 15, sample B has a duration of 25. So we know 100% for sure that sample A died before sample B. So my model should predict, a good model should predict a higher number, a higher probability for sample A versus sample B. You can kind of see this as how, um, who is more likely to die essentially. Who is more likely to die sooner? So is it a coordinate pair? Yes. Now what's an example of this coordinate pair? Let's say I have uh, sample A, the status is known, but sample B, the status is not known. And even though I don't know when status sample B died, I do know that they do, will eventually die, and that they died after sample A. I can, I can conclusively, I can, um, I can definitively conclude that. So my model should predict a higher number for sample A than sample B. But my, mo my model made a mistake and instead uh, predicted a smaller number for sample A versus sample B. So this is a disappointing pair. That's, that's bad for the seedness. That would decrease your seedness. You don't want that. Now, um, case number three is a little bit more interesting. I call this the dark case. What if sample A has a very low duration, like five, and sample B has a very high duration, but sample and even though sample B's death is known, sample A's death is completely unknown. Well, in this case, even though sample B has a higher number than sample A, you cannot, you cannot definitively conclude who died last, right? Sample A, for all you know, could have, even though they were last recorded at time equals five, they could have died at time equals five million, for all you know. And you would have, it's unlikely, but it could happen. And so it doesn't really matter what numbers, what model, um, what numbers the model assigns to these two samples because it can't really decide whether it's a concordant pair or not. So you just don't know. And I put an emoji there to represent that, I like emojis. And I call these the dark cases. Uh, and the last case is actually probably one of the more interesting ones. What if you have tied in time? So both sample A and sample B died at the same time. Time equals 20. And sample A, we know they died for sure at that time. But sample B, their death was not observed. Well, you can, this is actually still considered a concordant pair because even though you don't know when sample B died, you know that it died after time equals 20, which is the time that sample A died. So you can, you, so if your model uh, assigns the numbers correctly, you can de definitively conclude whether it's a concordant pair. Now another interesting fact about the C index is it's invariant to scale and location transformations. pearson spearman correlations and the AUC also share <coughs> Uh, this property. So it doesn't matter what the actual values of your predictions are. All that matters matters is the relative values. <clears throat> so uh, since we're also talking about um, evaluating models, I should also talk about overfitting. I think it's a good example. And if you go on Wikipedia, overfitting is defined as the production of an analysis that corresponds too closely or exactly to a particular set of data and may therefore <coughs> therefore fail to fit additional data or predict future observations reliably. And that's a mouthful. So I think overfitting is best explained through pictures and memes, because that's how I understand the world, through memes. So look at this picture. We have three different models here. One, the first one's uh, definitely overfitting. And um, you have, you can see that uh, you have all these, um, these sinusoidal curves. It's oscillating a lot. This is a classic example of overfitting. <coughs> Let's say a polynomial function, your polynomial is too high. But if you have an optimal model that's just right, then the curve will have a few mistakes. But overall, when you try this new red test data set, that's when the error is minimized. You can also have underfitting where your model is just too simple and the error, error is too large. So you need to find that sweet spot. You need to find the, Goldi you need to find the Goldilocks number uh, between underfitting and overfitting. Here's some memes that also explain overfitting pretty well. I think this last one is the best explanation over overfitting. Overfitting is also a very big beginner's mistake. A lot of times, even I make this mistake, a lot of times I see, oh, my model is doing well, but really I'm just overfitting to the training data. And when you 
uh, generalize the model to new test data, you find out your model is not actually uh, performing as well as you think it does. Now, since I'm also talk, since we're uh, talking about overfitting and evaluating models, we should also talk about cross validation. Cross validation is defined with Wikipedia, any of various similar model validation techniques for assessing how the results of a statistical analysis would generalize to an independent data set. Um, one of the most popular versions of cross validation is k fold cross validation. At the bottom here, I have a picture of four fold cross validation that perfectly illustrates how it works. Let's say you have no training. Let's say you have no testing data, just training data. What you would do is you split uh, the data into uh, four equal parts, four mutually equal uh, exclusive parts. And in each of the four iterations, you would train on three quarters of the data and leave out one quarter of the data for testing. And then you repeat that process three more times. And then you, uh, and then that will give you a general idea of how well your model um, generalizes to uh, new test data. Now, when should you, why should you use cross-validation? You should use cross-validation if you want to flag problems like overfitting. Uh, you should use cross-validation if you want an objective way, or a somewhat objective way, to compare models and hyperparameters. Maybe you want to see which model is the best model to use for your data, but you want to see which hyperparameters to use, how big should your neural network be, or how big, how, what order should your polynomial be, and you should also use it if you lack a, you completely lack an independent objective test set. Now, I'm going to introduce one right. That's the title of this talk, and this is our. This, is, as its name implies, it's invented by Professor Guan, and it's her solution for addressing the survival analysis problem. As a relatively simple algorithm, let's. I'm going to give a simple example in the, on the right here. What you do is you probabilistic. First step, it's a three-step algorithm. First, you probabilistically add the duration to right-censored samples using Kaplan-Meier estimator. In this case, I have five samples here. None of them are right-censored, so skip that first step for now. You didn't convert uh, the imputed durations to percentile ranks. So that's also pretty simple. Here I have five samples, and you convert them to ranks going backwards, of course. So this tells you who, who died first, who died first and who died last, right? And you go from one to zero. So there's five samples, so you're going to have percentiles at 100%, 75%, 50%, 25%, and 0%. Those numbers make, um, make sense, um, um, obviously. And then you apply a regression model, such as random forest, forest and its percentile ranks. It's just it's like, it's, like, um, it's like taking the SAT. Your scores are converted from a 1,600 point scale to a percentile scale. And percentiles are much easier to deal with. Now, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. What happens if two of these samples are censored, right censored? Now, I notice this sample here and this sample here is censored. Now, the Guam rate does, is a little bit different. It, it makes a little bit less sense, but when you, when you wrap your head around it, it kind of makes some sense. So now, if the order goes from sample one, you know that guy died first. Then sample three dies, suppose second. And sample two died third, sample four died uh, fourth, and sample five still died last. So you notice now these two guys over here, they switch order. Even though their durations would, tell, um, would imply that uh, maybe subject three should die after subject two, because you don't actually know when subject two actually died, you assume, based on the Kaplan-Meier estimator, you add a little bit of time to subject two, because you know you don't know when they died, but you do know they died a little bit after. They, you do know that they died sometime after time two fifty seven, and and since your Kaplan Meier estimator is has very little data to begin with, um, what ends up happening is you added you just added enough time to assume. Remember this is, this is more of an art than science. You added just enough time to assume now that subject two died after subject three. And the Guan ranks are changed accordingly. Now, the Guan rank algorithm is very flexible. You can use any regression model. You can use friend force, use your neural network, use support vector, anything you want. Use anything to your heart's content. And if a regression model perfectly uh, reproduces the Guan ranks, it will have a C index of 1. That's why we use the Guan rank as is. And of course, the model is. Pretty simple to understand. It's actually already implemented in Arvind Rao's lab. 
without actually with very little instruction from us actually. And biologists really like things they understand. If they don't understand it, then they won't use it. So or sometimes. Uh, so that's great. And it works well in practice. And you know, things that work in practice, you know, this is the engineering solution. You love your duct tape and your WD forty. As long as it works and does what you want, who, who really who really cares, right? Depending on who you are. And I mentioned dark cases earlier. Um, those are cases where when you're comparing two individuals, you can't definitively conclude who actually died first. Supposedly, according to Professor Guan, um, this method, the Guan rank algorithm here, implicitly kind of handles those dark cases by trying to assume who actually died first and who died last. And normally, these dark cases are ignored by the partial log likelihood function that I showed you earlier, which is what the Cox model attempts to optimize. So this is possibly one point in the Guan rank's favor. I don't know how true that actually is, but um, it's from the creator herself, and let's just assume it's true, right? So where can you find the Guan rank? So of course, I'm a computer scientist. I'm going to put everything open source on GitHub. You can find it on GitHub. The ironic part is it's actually a private GitHub. My friend Vivek here actually pointed that out to me. So you can't actually find it. But if if you actually do if you actually do want to find it, then uh, one day you'll be able to find it here when it goes from private to public. Now um, it's completely Python, and the reason why I wrote it in Python is because computer scientists are totally in love with Python, and we want we want we want this to appeal to a large computer science machine learning um, audience because this is. A very, this is a very good machine learning problem, but survival analysis is completely in the hands of uh, statisticians at the moment, and that's why the R survival library is a lot more popular. But I want more machine learning, more computer scientists, pure computer scientists to enjoy how to do survival analysis. So that's why we make it Python, but we will make an R version later. I also wanted to adhere to the scikit-learn API. And I give a small example on the right side here. It's, please, it's, I know you're no, not normally supposed to put code in a presentation, but hopefully this is easier enough. If you want to use my algorithm, I, uh, if you know how to use scikit-learn, then you already know how to use the Guan, uh, the Guan rank repository. Let's say you just import the Guan rank library using standard uh, Python never imports. And you could, if you want to use a, re, uh, a regression model stand, such as random forest regression, Follow the regular site learn um, API, load your model, load your data, uh, create a ranker here, fit the ranker to uh, your Y data. So since my since the one rank algorithm follows the site learn API, it's going to follow the fits and transform uh, standard. And then you just fit your regression model to your covariates or features and using the one rank transform Y labels as your labels. And then you can create your predictions here. So now I'm going to talk about why the site hit learn. Uh, I know I talked so much about it, but I'm going to explain it a little bit more in depth here and so why it's so great. Seems like one, the one rank R is public. There's already a one rank R version. We, kept, we made a public version so that other people can understand it. Um, ahead of time, it's not very well maintained, but there's enough examples on there to get you started. It doesn't follow the scikit-learn um, API, and it's not Python, and you know how much I love Python, right? Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. so if, 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 you want, if you want Guan rank right now, you can go on the Guan Lab repository and just get the R version, but my version is better, <laughs> <laughs> because it's mine. <laughs> You just can't have it yet. OK, so what is Scikit-Learn, and why is it so great that we use Scikit-Learn? Um, Scikit-Learn is a popular machine learning library in Python, widely used in both academic and industrial settings. It's a simple, efficient library, built on top of standard libraries like NumPy, SciPy, <laughs> and it's accessible to, accessible to everybody and reusable in various contexts. Now, it says everybody. I don't know how true that is. I don't, I don't know how many people here actually use Scikit learn. We kind of live in it. Academics kind of live in a bubble, right? So what's popular in other fields or what in industry may not necessarily be popular here. Sure, at least one, at least one or two of you uses Scikit learn, right? But four of you should use Scikit learn. Uh, and it's open source, which is great. 
and it has so many. It's so popular, and it has so many useful functions for classification regression, clustering, dimensional value reduction, model selection, pre-processing, and it's so standardized. Um, in fact, a lot of the most popular popular machine learning and related algorithms are on here because they have a very strict criterion on what's allowed into their, uh, their library. Usually, um, as a rule of thumb, this is not always followed. But uh, an algorithm is only allowed in scikit-learn if it's, I think, at least two or three years old, has 200 citations, follows the fit transform um, paradigm, and is popular. And I guess popularity is based on how many uploads it gets on Reddit or something like that. I, I know that sounds a little facetious, but you'd be surprised by how computer science is correct. They just they don't really use um, published journals like Nature. They use Archive and Reddit as their main source of information, or blogs. So um, now let's put long rank into perspective. Uh, let's see how well it actually does in practice. So I'm going to use tenfold cross-validation here. And I'm sure you're all experts in tenfold cross-validation by now. Let's focus on the plot here. Please excuse how the one on the left looks completely different on the right. The plot on the left came from the 2015 Dream um, AOS uh, challenge. I think AOS is our name for Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Yeah. yeah. A myotrophic lateral sclerosis. Right. Lou Gehrig's disease. Right. Yep. So Dr. Guan uh, did this challenge several years ago, and she just like a long time ago dumped all this data on me. And <coughs> frankly, I didn't want to redo the analysis because it's kind of messy going through old data and old code. And so I just did the next best thing and copied a plot from her figure and hope <coughs> that this copy is actually representative of real results. Um, what she did was, for her winning first place algorithm, she applied, she calculated the guan rate and then used the Gaussian process progression uh, as her model. This data has six features, 7,000 samples, and 50% of the data is right censored. And you can see it has a pretty good, about 5% better in terms of tenfold CV index on top of the Cox models. Not bad, pretty good. One first place, apparently 5% is all you need to win first place, right? Mm -hmm. Several tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, there's, there's a lesson in there. I will talk more about that later. Right. I, have a meme, I have a meme for that later. <laughs> all right, so since I didn't want to reproduce her data because it was kind of a hot mess, I decided to look for other data sets out there. Um, so here's uh, another popular survival analysis data set, the Veterans Administration Lung Cancer Trial. This data set has eight features, 137 samples, and 6.6% percent censored. And I can't really conclude whether one model is better than the other. I use Guan Rank and combining Guan Rank with three different regression models, random forest, gradient boosting, out of and they're all really kind of like statistically within the range of each other. So you can't conclude if anyone is better. So that's kind of a dead end. I was kind of I was pretty sad about that. But then, for, fortunately, in this machine learning, there's always another data set out there. So I looked for another data set in the same library, and I found a 76 gene prognostic signature for no negative breast cancer patients. This is a more this is a more crazy data set. It has 82 features, 198 samples, and 74.2 percent sensor. And lo and behold, all the Guan rank based methods do a lot better than Cox. Like, in, in fact, I would I mean. I can actually confidently say that, on average, the difference between the one rank models and the Cox models is even more staggering. The difference is even more staggering than what you saw in the Dream Challenge over here. So, yay! We found we found we justified our existence for writing for writing the algorithm. Is it the number of features? What's so, is it you know? It's you can't actually conclude. You can't actually con you can't actually conclude from three samples like when does our model work best? Small sample size. It, lo it looks like the more features you have, um, the better. But this one actually has the fewest yeah, features, right? So, or how much it's censored, or maybe it's how much it's censored, right? Yeah, right. That's yeah. even more, more worse. Yeah. Yeah. This one is really censored. So it may be it, it may be the more censored data you have, the better Guan rank for performance or Cox. But we need a lot more data sets so to include that. For your third data set. You exclude those sensor data. Will you have about the same performance of Cox? 
oh, what happens if I do this um, this temporal cross validation analysis using like training a model using only the non-sensor data? So I actually I actually tried that with here, and it doesn't actually <coughs> using that approach. I, I actually got a, get a box plot that's also within this range too. So clearly the not using the sensor data. Oh, I mean the third AI set. Yeah, but there's no difference when you start out. <clears throat> He's asking like if you take the one on the right, where there is a difference. Oh, now so if I only use like the twenty five percent that's non sensor. Yeah. I should I should do that next. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's good. I, I don't generally machine learning it's a bad idea to get rid of data, right? You generally <laughs> want to keep I mean there are some cases where you might want to throw away data, like if it's very noisy, but generally you don't want to throw away your data. But yeah, I'll look at that next. So the cost model cannot use the uncensored, uh, the sensor data, right? What do you mean uncensored? Uh, so, so the sensor data can the cost model use it? The, the cost model accounts for the sensor. The partial log likelihood function that it uses, it's, it tries to maximize all the concordant pairs. The problem is it's going to, so that means it will also include sensor data points because some sensor data points are in included in concordant pairs, right? The problem with the partial log likelihood, supposedly, according to Dr. Guan, is it uh, the partial log likelihood cannot account for the dark cases. So like what if you have two samples that are sensor? You can't conclude who's gonna die <coughs> later. But the Guan rank tries to massage that data and tries to conclude who dies later. Doesn't always work. So yeah, I, I said I was going to do address what um, Brian said. Earlier. This is the last slide. Some some final thoughts. Of course, I'm going to apply the model, uh, the Guan Rank algorithm on more data sets because we need to show on as many data sets as possible why our model is the best and why you shouldn't use anyone else's. For the Just kidding. Um, but since the Guan Rank algorithm currently uh, follows the Scikit-Learn API. That means I can do all these cool things with it. I can do hyperparameter tuning. I can do ensembling. I can do feature selection. And feature selection is actually one of the more interesting ones. Let's say you don't care about accuracy, but you want you care about say this like this is a semi six gene um, data set. What do you care about finding the six most informative genes for predicting survival? Then you can already do that with one the Guan Rank algorithm because it follows the Scikit-Learn API. And there's actually already other GitHub examples where you see other people doing something similar for different kinds of data sets. Another thing I'm interested, I'm very excited about is because you can use any regression model, you can, I, you can in theory do deep learning or deep convolutional neural networks with images with the Guan Rank algorithm. So you could probably use your imagination. You could, Imagine a, a scenario where, I don't know, you take a picture of someone and you predict when they're going to die or something like that. Or you take a picture of fruit and predict based on the picture when it's going to rot or spoil, right? And I say, I say this a lot, this is my mantra, uh, sometimes science is more art than science. And a lot, sometimes science is more art than science. A lot of people don't get that. And the Guan Rank algorithm is not perfect, but it does what it's supposed to, and it's easy to understand, works well in practice. Another argument I'm going to conclude with this: um, some people argue why sh why should it be why should you bother making another model that's just slightly more accurate than other uh, models? Uh, why add why add to the plethora of algorithms that are already out there? And I'm going to use two arguments. One is the Burger King argument: have it your way. <coughs> so there's a theorem in machine learning called the No Free Lunch theorem which um, states that um, when you average each model's performance across all problems, all their, um, then their overall performance will remain the same, will be the same across all problems. This basically means that no one model will always outperform any other model on every single data set. You need to pick the right tool for the right problem. And it doesn't hurt to have more options. In fact, in this data set over here, I actually had a bad, big problem with Cox. I mentioned very earlier, all the way back here, that um, there's an inverse of a matrix here for the Cox model. That causes huge numerical instability. So when I was training my Cox model for this data set, I actually had a divide by zero incident here. Yeah, it couldn't, uh, the determinant of the Hessian matrix in that case was almost zero, and I was below, was below machine epsilon. 
it was causing all sorts of numerical issues. So I actually had to. I had yeah. So I had to massage. I had to like use a modified version of COPS in this case. Massage it. Wrong link. You never run across that problem. It pretty much works almost every single time. If it doesn't work, tell me and put it, post it on GitHub on issues where we become public, and I'll try to fix it. Um, yeah. So more options is always good. And the second argument I will use is from. Uh, our Lord and Savior, Andrew Ng, who said <laughs> as speech recognition accuracy goes from 95% to 99%, we'll go from barely using it to using it all the time. So I'm going to conclude with that. Any questions? Can you go to the, uh, the C index slide? The C, C index one, the one he yeah, approved. Yeah, this one. I think for the last room, last case, so you know that the sample A died first, right? Mm -hmm. But sample B died oh, I, I, put, oh, I think you reversed it. I reversed it, it. Yeah, yeah. I put a typo there. Yeah, I think, yeah. <coughs> Thanks for catching that. And uh, I think another yeah. thing I think just want to say is uh, I think Yuan Fang's solution to generate the Guan Ram is similar to, you know, because you have the KM curve. So mathematically, the area under the curve is the you know, the expected lifetime right, right. So I think just uh, when you have an uncensored data point, you just add the area of the curl mm -hmm. to that patient. And then this is the, the best, you know, estimation of it's the, the best. Of, yeah, yeah. how long this, this person will die. Or, I mean, how long this person yeah. will live. Or. I'm sure you can think of like other solutions. Like you could do some sort of like, I don't know, k-means clustering and try to find um, Try to, if you have a sensor data point, try to find their five most similar uncensored um, buddies and try to conclude uh, their, uh, at that time from how similar they are. You, you, can probably, you can think of all sorts of ways to impute better. Uh, I want to ask uh, how, how many um, features uh, you can possibly handle? Do you handle hundreds of features? Or and you're limit you're completely limited by whatever regression model you use. The Guan Ring algorithm doesn't take that long run. It runs in old, a big old end. So I mean, uh -huh. if it if it takes a long time to run, you probably have too much data, right? If the only thing you have to worry about is whether your regression model will finish fitting. So if the regression model um, doesn't fit, uh, can't handle all your features or all, all your samples, it's not a problem with Guan Ring. It's a problem with the regression model. Well, another question is like, uh, can you handle also like temporal data and like, the time? As, uh, so, are you talking about continuous time features like I don't know, like hair length, for example, which will change <laughs> as much the time? Uh, the quantum rate algorithm doesn't account for that yet. There are some versions of the Cox model that does account for that. I haven't studied that yet. I need a data set that has that before I can bother benchmarking it, okay. right? Um, <laughs> But I would, but if there's already a regression model that can handle, if there's already a regression model that can handle it, then it's it's not that it's not that it's not that difficult to combine with one rank. There are there are actually some data set you look at some cancer progression on kind of different stages mm -hmm. try to see whether it can come out with something interesting. Mm -hmm. If you have those data sets, I'm um, send them my way. I'm well, I'm gonna write like a high-profile paper about this, and it's just gonna be talk. It's just gonna be applying this algorithm over and over again on different cases, sociology examples, engineering oh. analysis, all sorts of things. So we can help you get some of those data sets. Just come see me, and I'll look you up the right guy. All right. Yeah. Cool. The more diversity you have, yeah, the better. Right. Exactly. Your third data set only have. 76 genes. How? What is the extra features? Uh, yeah. So 82 is clearly a bigger number than uh, 76, right? So well, some of them are like age and sex, and some of those features. There's other uh, features that are one hot coded too. There's also a treatment feature. Okay. Any other questions for Daniel? Great job. Thanks. Thank you.
I love the 